So good afternoon once again, everyone. Today we have a presentation on a bridge uh, presentation. Uh, this is going to be presented by Dr. Velda, who is a resident at the Kamali Teaching Hospital. And we are graciously supervised by Dr. Hawa, who is a consultant gynecologist at the Tamale Teaching Hospital. My name is Dominic, and I'm with Ghana Medical Health. I invite Dr. Hawa uh, to kindly introduce the presentation, and then we can start. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dominic, for the introduction. And we are all welcome to this afternoon's presentation. Um, I'm very certain that at the end of this one hour account encounter, we will all go home with some refreshment of our memories about bridge presentation and a few cobwebs sticking out um, as well. We all know what bridge presentation is and Dr. Velda is going to do justice to the topic. Very simple, very easy. So that we take the keynote messages along whilst we, we leave this uh, virtual platform. So let's stay tuned and let's enjoy the presentation. Over to you. Velda. Hello. Yeah, Dr. Velda, we can hear you. You can go ahead, please. It's better now. Okay. Yes, please. We can hear you. Hello, Velda. I think the network in the hospital is just very terrible this afternoon. Let's try and reconnect with her again. Can you please hear me? We can yeah, hear you yes. now. My network is yeah. very challenging. Okay, so so I'll just dive into it. So bridge presentation is a fetus in a longitudinal lie with the buttocks or the feet presenting first in the pelvis. That's the definition for bridge presentation. Typically, a fetus will spontaneously assume a cephalic presentation as the gestures, the buttocks or the feet, or even both present at the pelvis before the head. And that is what we refer to as bridge presentation. And its incidence decreases with increasing gestational age, meaning the more close you are to term, the more likely you are to be cephalic than breech. So as a pregnancy approaches term, the incidence of breech presentation tends to reduce. We have to 22 to 25% occurring before 28 weeks, 7 to 15% at 32 weeks gestation. And by term, it's usually three to 5% of singleton gestations. Perinatal mortality increases two to four folds in breach presentation, regardless of the mode of delivery. And in about 5% of singleton breach, 
the head may be hyperextended, what is typically called the stargazing sign. And this poses more challenge with the delivery of the after coming head. There are three main types of breach presentation. We have the frank breach, which occurs in 50 to 70% of all breach presentations. And with this one, the hips are usually flexed. The knee is extended, what is called the pike position. The second type is a complete breach, which is usually in five to 10% of um, breach presentations. So with this, the hips are flexed, but the knees are extended cold. And then we have the incomplete breach, also known as the footling breach. And it occurs in 10 to 30% of cases. And you have one or both hips extended. And then a foot is presenting at the, the lowermost part of the pelvis. So this is a picturesque description of how breach presentations look like. So the first picture, we have the front breach. Hips are flexed, so it seems like the baby is sitting, but the legs are extended with their feet almost close to their fetal head. The second is a complete breach, where you have both the, the, the hips and the knees flexed, bringing the buttocks, the genitalia, and sometimes the feet um, to present at the opening of the pelvis from below. Then the foot limb breach, where you have one foot dropping lower than the rest of the body, and so presenting first, is also known as the incomplete breach. Why is breach presentation of essence? It's because there are clinical implications. When you diagnose breach presentation, there are implications to both mother. Next slide, please. The slide has changed. You go ahead. It's slow on your end. Hello, Velda. Hello, Velda. I think she may still be having some network challenges because uh, she's not on. Okay, so she's back now. Hello. We can hear you now. Oh, I've not been on. Okay. No. So they're clinical. <laughs> yeah, clinical implications. Clinical implications of breach presentation. So the breach presentation may indicate a pathology or abnormality of the fetus, the uterus or amniotic fluid and the placenta. 
So with the fetus, usually it is abnormalities of the upper part of the fetal body, which could be hydrocephalus, it could be cystic hygromas on the neck, it could be anything making the upper part of the body bulkier than the breech. It could also be um, biconoids, uterus, uterus edelphys, anything that reduces the space of the uterus, the intrauterine cavity. And then you have extremes of amniotic fluid volume. That's oligohydramnios or polyhydramnios. Then placenta abnormalities. Perinatal mortality too is increased with breach presentation regardless of mode of delivery. It affects the decision on mode of delivery. Maternal morbidity and risk of operative delivery also increases with breach. You need skilled delivery and you need multidisciplinary involvement. The predisposing factors for breach presentation, we have fetal factors such as multiple pregnancy. But they are moving faster than me. <laughs> okay. No, I'm back. I'm so back to where you are. Thank you. So the predisposing factors of breach presentation in fetus, we have situations of multiple pregnancy, fetal abnormality like CNS abnormalities, that's the central nervous system, oligo or polyhydramnios, fetal growth restriction, short umbilical cords, and then extended legs of the fetus. For I hope she's not talking, thinking we are hearing her. Oh, good. Hello, Velda. We can't hear you. Um, Mality, such as you try and vibrate a consultant and hit up. Hmm. Well, can you try repositioning? You keep going off. We can't hear you. Okay. So I'm back. Night. So with the diagnosis, we have clinical patient or hmm. the Leopold maneuvers during a balotable structure in the farm. Okay. So you could also have the fetal heart um, being picked up above the level of the umbilicus. On vaginal examination, then the fetal porosities, the anus, the genitalia, and the foot may provide landmarks to know what is presenting at the pelvis. And also ultrasounds can. So they will be able to pick up that the fetus is in a breach presentation. Previously, which is not done again, we used to have x-rays as a way to pick up a breach presentation. So you follow the curvature of the spine, and um, the fetal head bones to be able to tell what is presenting at the pelvis. But that is not routinely done anymore. But still with all these advancements in about 30% of cases, the diagnosis may never be made until the mother presents to you in labor. 
So it's good to know that so that when you're doing your vaginal examinations, you know you could pick it up there. So how do we manage a breach presentation? The management is guided by three main things. Are we dealing with a term breach, a preterm breach, or is it a second twin in the breach position, in the breach presentation? For both twins breach, leading breach, usually we just do a cesarean section for them. So looking at what we do at the labor world, these are the important factors we need to take into consideration. So for a term breach, what do we do? When the breach is picked up at term, next slide, please. There could be a spontaneous version, meaning no intervention is put in place, but somehow the fetus is able to turn back into the cephalic presentation. And we could also do external cephalic version for breech fetuses, elective cesarean section, and vaginal delivery. So for spontaneous version, it is less frequent as the third trimester progresses. So less than 25% of the breaches you pick at term are likely to have a spontaneous version. And it's more likely in the multiparous patient, less likely in nulliparous, and with breach with extended legs. Um, Factors that promote spontaneous version include a full bladder, the mother in knee chest position 10 minutes every day at least, pelvic elevation, abduction of the thighs, and relaxed breathing. These are all harmless techniques worth trying, but can't be recommended in the absence of supporting evidence. So there's really no evidence to support these maneuvers, but some people have had success and then their fetuses have undergone version with that. External cephalic version is the next thing we can do. If you pick up a breach antenatally, you can, that's, it refers to the transdominal, transabdominal manual rotation of the fetus into cephalic presentation. If you attempt this in 100 cases, 34, would still end up in breach delivery and 14 may end up in cesarean sections and we'll soon see why. The success rate is around 50 to 60% and the success is higher in multiparous patients. In patients where you have the head and the knees flexed, when you use tocolytics for the external cephalic version and also the use of regional anesthesia, all these allow for you trying and maternal muscle relaxation for you to be able to do the version. So this is a picture. Imagine this in a pregnant woman. You need to palpate the abdomen very well to know where your hands will be placed. So your non-dominant hand is, would be on the fundus applied over the head of the fetus. And you do what they call the downward roll. So with your dominant hand on the breech, you keep the baby flexed. Try not to make, try to make sure that no part of the baby extends or the fetus is extended during the maneuver. And with this, you need to apply a lot of gel on the abdomen because it would help to make it easy for you to slide your hands over the abdomen. And also for fetal heart rate monitoring so that at any point in time, any part of the abdomen, a probe can be placed. You can either do your ultrasound scan or do your CTG to assess or your Doppler to assess the fetal heart rate. So with one quick switch motion, you flip the baby into the cephalic position. Some people do the, the other way around, but this is more commonly used. There are some prerequisites you need before you do the external cephalic version. And that means that one of them is that the fetus should be more than 36 weeks gestation because the smaller the fetus is with more lycor around, more space around, it's easy for the fetus to convert back into the breech presentation. Typically we do it around 37 weeks. 
then you need an ultrasound scan there with you when you are doing the version to confirm the breach first, confirm enough lipo, and to rule out any contraindication to breach, like placenta previa, cord around the neck, and other um, things that will make your version not successful or complicated. Then you need a cardiotocograph pre and post the external cephalic version to be able to monitor the fetal heart rate and pick up any abnormalities to intervene accordingly. And you must have facilities to perform emergency cesarean section. So please let's not practice this where we do not have operating rooms to be able to move the patients in quickly as possible. If you have the room, but then the, the theater staff and all you need is not ready, please do not um, try a an external cephalic version where you are. You also need an informed consent for the procedure because there are risks that are very real and you may need to do an emergency cesarean section because you could have abrupt shows, fetal distress, rupture of membranes or caring and you must intervene there and then. The patient should have fasted for more than six hours um, there's also room for taking liquid diet for at least two hours. So clear liquids two hours prior to procedure. And then for mothers who are rhesus negative, you have to give them anti-D immunoglobulin before you start the external cephalic version. Contraindications, they are absolute and relative. So absolute include antipartum hemorrhage from any cause multiple pregnancy, placenta previa, ruptured membranes, fetal abnormalities, um, a deflexed head. So where the head is extended, you are not likely to achieve um, success, so you don't do it. And then in a previous cesarean section, relative ones include IGR, severe preeclampsia. Now with that one, for a patient who has had a previous placenta abrupt show, um, and has preeclampsia, the risk is almost double because there's likely to be an abrupt show again. And also racist isoimmunization, obesity, macrosomic babies. We do not do external cephalic version for these category of patients. Caesarean delivery for breach. When do we do CS for our breaches? We don't even want to try vaginal delivery. The indications include naliparity. So as a country, this is where we are. For analips, we do not do breach delivery for them. For patients with inadequate or contracted pelvis, we do not do breach prior cesarean deliveries from one previous year. So two, three is not even entertained. Then fetal weight of greater than 3,500 grams, severe IUGR with a weight less than 2,500 grams, incomplete or footling bridge presentation, fetal anomaly not compatible with bridge delivery, oligohydramnios, a hyperextended neck, preterm fetuses with weight less than 1.5 kilos or a gestational age less than 32 to 34 weeks. So you need to um, juxtapose your fetal weight with this gestational age to take a right decision then lack of skilled personnel to conduct the delivery, inability to do an emergency cesarean delivery should something go wrong during the vaginal delivery, twin gestation with leading breach, and then a Zatushni Andro score of zero to four. We will soon look at what the Zatushni Andro score is. So these are the indications for cesarean section. Now for vaginal delivery, for a client you have cleared for vaginal delivery, what are the types we can have? You have the spontaneous breach delivery where the fetus is expelled entirely with no tractions or manipulations, except for some support for the fetus. So we don't recommend this kind of delivery because it's almost like you let the mother to just push out her baby, knowing fully well that there will be complications with the delivery of the progressively non-compressible and bigger parts that follow the breach. That's the thorax, the arms, the head. Then we have the assisted breach delivery. 
where the infant is allowed to deliver spontaneously up to the level of the umbilicus. Then we help with maneuvers to assist the delivery of the remaining body with or without maternal expulsive force. So these maneuvers include the peanut love sets, the Mauricio smileyvate maneuvers, and others, which we'll look at soon. And then we have the two. The total breach extraction with the caregiver and the second swing in breach presentation with intact membranes. This is done in theater. Please, you need to set and the membranes must be intact. So we cannot try this in the lid. Hello, Velda. We've lost you again. Hello, Velda. Okay, so vaginal delivery. In modern obstetrics, we need some prerequisites for vaginal delivery. And the first, which is to me very important, is a careful selection of the candidates for vaginal delivery. Almost anything other than the indications for cesarean delivery, which we already looked at, um, can qualify for a vaginal delivery, but you still need to do a careful selection of your patients. And on upon arrival to you antenatally or at the labor ward, you need to determine your fetal weight and the gestational age accurately. Rule out contraindications for vaginal delivery. Mother needs an informed consent to, to, for you to go ahead with the delivery because there are consequences to her and the fetus and there may be need for operational interventions. Then you need facilities where emergency cesarean section can be done. You need to have had experience with vaginal breach delivery. Now this is where the controversy lies. There's really no cutoff for which category of staff. It's a matter of skill. If you are in the labor ward and you have the skill or you're a doctor, you have the skill. So it's more of skill than a category or a cadre of staff, then continuous monitoring facilities in labor, preferably the cardio tocogram. But in the absence of that, if you have your Doppler, which we'll soon see, you can do 15 minutes fetal heart checking and that should suffice for monitoring. And you should also have a low threshold for cesarean section. An ultrasound scan is very important in every labor ward because um, when the patient comes, some of them may not be picked up antenatally. Some of them may not be picked up antenatally. And so you would need a scan to be able to get your gestational age right. Okay. So for the Zatushni Andro score, which I mentioned earlier, it is a prognostic scoring index that we use to assess patients to know whether they can undergo breach delivery. So when the patient comes, you want to know her parity. The more parous she is, the higher the score she, she gets. So if you have a nalip, the nalip scores zero, um, a primi para scores one, multi para scores two. For gestational age, 39 weeks or more, you score zero. 38 weeks, you score one. 37 weeks, you score two. 
cervical dilatation, 2 cm is 0, 3 cm is 1, 4 cm is 2. A previous successful breach delivery. It's not clearly stated here, but it's a previous successful breach delivery. For none, you score 0, 1, you score 1, 2, you score 2. Then you assess the station of the presenting part. So minus 3 is 0, minus 2 is 1. A station of minus 1 scores 2. Estimated fetal weight 3.6 kilos is 0, so 3.5 and above. Then 3.2 to 3.6, you score 1. Less than 3.2 kilos, you score 2. The maximum score is 11. A score of greater than 7 predicts good prognosis for vaginal delivery. A score of 0 to 4, you, must, you have to offer the consider offering the patient a cesarean delivery. And between four and seven, you can do a watchful waiting and then see what happens. Monitor the patients closely. So patients has arrived to us in labor. Let's assume we have a patient with breech presentation who has come to us at the labor ward. What do we do? We admit her to our maternity, to our labor ward. We start immediate fetal heart rate surveillance. So you need to check the, what the fetal heart rate is and then you recruit your assistants and then your other multidisciplinary staff to help you monitor the patient. You need an anesthetist. It's proposed that epidural anesthesia is, is, is good to monitor a breach presentation because you would use it both in your first stage and your second stage. Breach labors have been documented to prolong and um, to be more prolonged than cephalic presentations. You also need a neonatologist for resuscitation, usually for, if you compare cephalic and breach delivery, the breach is likely to have lower APGES and need more resuscitation than the cephalic presentation. So if you do not have a neonatologist, any staff trained in newborn resuscitation should be present. Then you gain IV access for the mother. Assess her cervical dilatation, the state of her membranes, the presenting part, and then the station. If the client is not known to you and has not had a pelvimetry done, you quickly do a clinical pelvimetry and then decide whether this pelvis is adequate or not. And there you decide to continue monitoring or to do a cesarean delivery, depending on the outcome of your assessment. Then you also do sonographic assessment. So you want to know what's the attitude of this fetus. Is the fetus flexed? What's the weight presenting to me in this labor ward? What's the lycal volume like? Do I have nuchal cords? Do I have a short cord? You want to just have an overview of what is in the uterus. Then analgesia, or even if it's a foot limb breach, then you take a decision. Then you give analgesia, like I said, epidural preferably, and then you monitor the labor on a pathograph. So this is um, an image, we have an image demonstrating the, the extended neck you could have with breech presentation. So you see the neck like that, the stargazing sign. So it almost looks like the child is, the baby, the fetus is looking into the sky to see the beautiful stars over, over there. So once you have that, you do not continue to monitor the patient for delivery via continuous vaginal delivery. So once you have decided, okay, we are monitoring a woman, you need a one-on-one -on -one monitoring um, for her, preferably, unless of course you are short staff, but as much as possible, one midwife should be at, at, assigned to her because of the high risk of cord prolapse. And then you do a continuous fetal heart rate monitoring or every 15 minutes monitoring with intermittent device. And then you do as you place a scalp electrode on the buttocks, try to avoid the genitalia. That's if you have that available in your facility. And then you immediately do a vaginal exam following rupture of membranes, again, because of the risk of cord prolapse. And then you monitor for fetal heart rate for at least five to 10 minutes after membrane has ruptured, because you could have 
um, an overt or an occult prolapse. So you need to monitor and see if there are any abnormalities, your suspicion has to be high. Then in second stage, once the breach is visible, active pushing is encouraged. We encourage a hands-off approach when it comes to the delivery. So you do not do anything. You just observe and support the fetus as it's coming until it gets to the umbilicus. So your hands are off the breach until the baby is delivered up to the umbilicus, then immediately you put in your maneuvers for assisted breach delivery. This is because the cord is now going to be compressed against the bony pelvis. And so you, you must as quickly as possible deliver the rest of the body. So this is the mechanism of delivery in a breach fetus. So they usually, the by trochanteric diameter, it would usually engage at the pelvis. Then as a breach descends, you have the anterior hip coming, then the posterior one also following, but the posterior one gets delivered before the anterior hip. Then you have a rotation of 45 degrees, an external rotation, which brings the sacrum anteriorly. Then the rest of the body would now be delivered. So you have your anterior shoulder coming, then the posterior shoulder, then the head also follows. So after the umbilicus, your maneuvers for assisted breach delivery would now start. Okay. So this is a typical presentation in the labor ward. The woman is in second stage. You can see thick meconium being passed the breaches are then tried to. So at this point, you quickly want to assess whether the patient is roomy. If the patient is not roomy enough and then the breach is well applied on the perineum, you want to give um, an episiotomy to help give you space for your various maneuvers. Next slide, please. So the recommended is a mediolateral episiotomy to avoid anal sphincter injuries. And then you allow the breach to deliver spontaneously to the level of the umbilicus. The posterior hip will usually deliver from the six o'clock position of the vagina. And then the anterior hip follows. External rotation will occur to bring the sacrum anteriorly. Then you encourage the mother to push and so the legs are visible. That's for the complete um, breach. But for the frank breach, then you have to do your peanut maneuver where you would now exert pressure in the popliteal fossa to flex the leg. So you press on the back of the knee, that's the popliteal fossa, and this causes the knee to flex. And then the foot comes down, then you can grab it and deliver the, the feet of the fetus. Okay, so, all right. These are these pictures demonstrating how they've been up to the, the picture displayed currently. Then this is for delivery of the anterior shoulder. So your hand, goes in into the elbow and then the arm of the hand of the baby yes so your finger in the elbow just sweep out the then you rotate the fetus for the shoulder on the one that was previously posterior.
So for the nuca, um, this baby has the arm extended and it's at the neck or behind the head at the occipital region. So you rotate the body 180 degrees anti-clockwise. And this will draw the elbow toward the face to be swept out in the same way you deliver the arm that is anterior. Then the delivery of the after coming head. So the head now is the bigger part of the fetal body and it's, it didn't get the chance to undergo molding. So you want to make sure that it is still flexed because the moment is extended, the delivery becomes difficult. It can get trapped in the, in the pelvis. So you do the Mauricio smiley weight maneuver. This time around, unlike we were taught previously, we don't put our fingers in the mouth of the baby because of the risk of infections being transmitted to the fetus. So you place both fingers on the maxilla and then someone gives you suprapubic pressure to maintain the flexion of the neck. And then you do a downward um, traction until you see the nape of the neck, then you lift the baby out of the pelvis, maintaining the suprapubic pressure so that you do not deflex the head. You could also use your pipette forceps to help to deliver the after coming head. So it's shaped to lie over the parietal bone. So you go sideways and then in the, within, between the two blades, the fetal trunk is usually accommodated and then you do a downward and outward um, delivery of the fetal head. Benefits of vaginal delivery for a breach include a reduction in the risk of newborn idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, less maternal morbidity and mortality compared with um, cesarean section, but the risk you are likely to face is a cord prolapse where you have to deliver abdominally within 30 minutes and then nuchal arms you we would need more stretching and pulling and more maneuvering, and it could lead to brachial plexus injuries, cervical spine injury, fracture of long bones, especially the humerus, then rupture of internal organs within the abdomen, intracranial hemorrhage, and low abgas, usually at one minute. So the golden minute, if you're able to intervene with your resuscitation, the baby should be fine. So it's important to have resuscitation measures and skilled staff on standby when you are doing a breach delivery. The complications of breach presentation include, so we'll look at them in two ways, maternal and fetal complications. The first for the mother being an increased risk of cesarean section and hysterotomy. So you could, we, if you remember the indications for CS, we said if the fetus is less than 1.5 kilos, that's a small baby, that's a small uterus. So you are going to make a classical incision on the uterus, and this would influence her next pregnancy, put her at risk of uterine rupture in subsequent pregnancies. And you also have hysterotomy, sorry, hysterotomy, an extension of the hysterotomy incision after the after coming head is entrapped. Cervical lacerations, perineal lacerations, uterine ruptures, cervical incisions. So sometimes even with vaginal delivery, when the after coming head is not, um, is entrapped, you have to make incisions on the cervix at the two o'clock and the 10 o'clock positions and sometimes at the six o'clock too. Just avoid the three o'clock and nine o'clock positions for the cervical branches of the uterine arteries and then deliver the head. You also have preparal sepsis because you're introducing a lot of things into the uterus, instruments and even the maneuvering. So there's risk of preparal sepsis. Then for the fetus, cord prolapse, hand entrapment, 
humeral or clavicular fracture, joints dislocations, hip dysplasia, intrapartum fetal death, neonatal morbidity, and mortality. Thank you. These are my references. I'll stop here and wait for contributions and questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Velda, for this elaborate presentation. Amidst all the challenges, I'm happy that at the getting to the middle part, we the network became more stable and we could hear you. So the 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 platform is open. Let's hear your comments. Let's have your questions and then we will try and answer them. Thank you. You can unmute yourself now if you have a question and please ask or contribution. Thank you. Hello. I hope uh, we can hello. be here. Yes, yeah, please, if you yeah, have a question, please go ahead and ask, or if you have a contribution, it's welcome. Janet, Asari, kindly go ahead with your question. Or mute yourself and ask. Or you type the question in the chat box, we will read it out. Janet, kindly unmute yourself. Good evening. Look, thank you very much. For the Good evening. The question is, um, can uh, CPD be uh, one of the complications of this? Can, can CPD Oh, I didn't hear well. Yes, CPD. Okay. And one of Can the it... mm -hmm. providers have already done uh, delivered the body out and it's left to the head to come out and it's not coming. What okay, well done. Over to you. Okay, so Janet, hi, I miss you. Um, okay, <laughs> so um, CPD, I think in the case, it, it can be a complication, but in the case of um, breach delivery, you are more likely to call it a head entrapment. And there are reasons why this happens, okay. So um, the head is the largest part of the fetus and the breach is smaller. So when you have the bridge coming out, sometimes it comes out through an undilated cervix. It will be able to pass through a cervix that is not 10 cm dilated. So when this happens, that is also very propulsive, more like a precipitate labor. And you can see this too in the preterm fetus. So when it happens, the larger head that is coming, the outer coming head, does not get the time to mold like you see with um, a cephalic presentation as it's coming down small, small like that. So it's still in its full diameter. And here is a case that is faced with an undilated cervix. It has been, it has been pushed down too fast. So these changes have not occurred. So you have it trapped up there. That's why now we say that we do the assisted vaginal delivery. So if you say you are waiting for the head to come out by itself, you are likely to have the baby asphyxiated before the cervix will even dilate to the 10 cm. So yes, CPD sort of, you can have it. The head will get trapped there, especially with the preterm, the 1.5 kilos. They have a much, much smaller body compared to the head. 
So it's just because of the mechanism of delivery that you have the head entrapment occurring. And if already this mother um, had an inadequate pelvis, you didn't get the chance to monitor her, to assess the pelvis. Maybe she came around ATM with the bridge already so down, you couldn't assess how the pelvis is, but the small bridge has passed through. You could have the head still stuck up there. So yes, it, it can happen, but you, you are likely to call it a head entrapment and not CPP. Okay. All right. So thank you very much, Velda. So in addition to what she has said, um, like in kephalic presentation, you can actually just say that there's kephalopelvic disproportion. When the fetus is breached, we call that fetopelvic disproportion. So in your assessment of the woman, the pelvis is not adequate and you think that she can't make this breach delivery, your diagnosis will not be kephalopelvic disproportion. This time it will be fetal pelvic disproportion. But then the likelihood of entrapment of their after coming head is real, especially when the babies are small and they slip through a, a, a service that is not fully dilated. And also if we didn't pick the a, a deflex head earlier, or in our haste to touch the baby, we touch the baby in such a way that we cause deflection of the head during the second stage. Then you would have entrapped after coming head. I hope we have clarified your question for you, Jane. Can we have any more questions or Uh, please, I think there's a question in the chat box. Hello? Hello? Yeah, hello. Can you please read it yeah. out for me? Hi. Okay, read so, the yeah, question out. It was me, yeah. Abdul Salam. First okay. of all, I said nice presentation. Ah. The first question is, how do you differentiate footling bridge from hand presentation? And the second was, okay. how do you indicate descent on the presenting part in bridge presentation on a pathograph? Okay. Okay. Velda. Hello, Velda. Okay, so since we don't have much time, I think her network is, is gone crazy again. So um, the first one is how do you tell the difference between a foot and a, a, a hand if you do vaginal examination? So we actually um, try to train our doctors and midwives to do this differentiation very well, even if you are going to do abdominal delivery, a cesarean section, because it's very important you know what you are pulling out. So if you do a VE and you are touching the foot, these are some of the pointers. There is a right angle, you know, you have a 90 degree angle between the foot and then the, the leg. Unlike the hand that everything is a straight line. And then when you look at the feet, the, the fingers of a neonate, you have all the different levels of the fingers. They are all not together and flush. Unlike the toes that you can have, the toe and all the other small toes, the big toe and all the other small toes are in a straight line. But when you touch the fingers, you can feel that difference. The other thing is also the gap between the thumb and then the index finger. It is wider than what you feel between the first toe and the rest of the small toes. So we, we encourage that once you put your hand in and you are feeling something and it's digits, you, you go around it, feel the, angulation between what you are feeling and then the the shaft which will be either the humerus or um, sorry the the lower arm or the tibia and fibula you should tell whether it's in a straight line or there's an angulation that should help you plus the other signs are added now on a pathograph you can monitor a breach delivery on a pathograph and instead of the circle that we use to denote denote the head we use a w to denote the fetal bottles, kind of. 
and to tell the station, we don't do descent because it will be difficult to do in descent. The landmarks you need for descent are for Kepalik, but we do station by vaginal examination, comparing the lowermost part of the presenting part to the ischial spines, and then you tell the descent of, of the fetus. I hope I've answered your question. Thank you. There's another hand up, I think, Nicolina. So please, can you unmute yourself and ask your question or your suggestion to be welcome? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Good afternoon Nicolina. Yes, sir, please. Uh, my question, the first question is um, about the Zatutini prognostic um, scoring in the as we have the abgas for it. So does it mean that when a client comes in and the ultrasound detect that this uh, the baby or the fetus which is presenting with the 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 bottom, meaning that you, you should have this tool before you access the person to know whether the person can deliver the vaginally. And then my second question too is about the cesarean section, about the institutional site. Um, this, you made mention of the classical incision, and then I didn't uh, maybe hear of the the is it the transverse. So I want to find out that in any breech presentation, does it mean that um, the incision incision is to be done classically, or maybe the the transverse cannot be done? Okay, well that you're back. Over to you. Yes. Uh huh. So um, let me start. The first question you asked about the Zatushni Andros call. So with that one, yes, it's important you have it in your labor ward so that any patient that comes in breach, once you have ruled out the known contraindications for breach delivery, like a previous CS, um, a naliparous patient, um, a preterm baby or a baby who has growth restriction and all those things. Once you rule them out, you now use this to score the patients and know how likely you are to achieve a successful um, breach delivery vaginally. So if you look at all the things there, they are what we usually say. Someone comes to the labor where they are like, oh, she has delivered before, so it's likely the baby will come through. Now, this is an objective tool. So it's important that we have it in our labor wards because mind you, it's not every client presenting to you that the breach was picked up antenatally or that the patient has been assessed for a successful vaginal delivery before she comes to you. So this tool will guide you. And once you give the patient your score, you interpret accordingly. So as my boss said, your station and all that, someone has come already dilated. Um, it will be fair to just assess and know, can we, can we try and see if this would achieve success? So this is how you are objective. You don't use your gut feeling or your instincts. This is objective. You can present it anywhere and say, this is what the patient's called. And so we think we can monitor or we cannot monitor. So it's important. We, we have it on our labor wards. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem so common, but somehow we know some of the, the success indicators from our practice and our experience, but this is more objective. And then the second question. So yes, the classical incision, I was referring to the preterm breach. If you remember, the indications for cesarean section, I talked about the fact that if a baby is less than 1.5 kilos, that's after the gestational age of viability. So after 28 weeks, you have a preterm labor coming into your ward. And then the patient is within 32 to 34 weeks um, gestational age such a client, it will be very risky for the fetus to allow for vaginal delivery. And at that gestational age, the lower segment is not formed. Okay, so we may cut transverse during the delivery, but 
It is a classical incision because it is in the upper uterine segment. But for term breaches, you would go with your routine lower uterine segment CS, that is the transverse incision. So this will be um, of relevance to you if you are assessing a previous vaginal delivery for a possible toe lag or VBAC. You need to ask when the CS was done. Mostly if it was done around 32, 34 weeks, it's likely that it was a classical cesarean section. So when the doctor is going to do CS, depending on the gestational age, we choose the appropriate incision on the uterus. So this doesn't go for all cesarean deliveries for breach, but for the preterm breaches. I hope I've answered the question. Okay, thank you very much, Velda. Any more questions? I think we've hit our 4 p.m. mark, but if we have any more questions or contribution, we can take one more and then we will call it a nice weekend. Okay. Okay. Doctor, I Nicolina, think there are some follow up to... questions. There okay, some follow -up on the chat box. I don't know, box, yeah. somewhere, somehow, I can't see. So please read them oh. out and let's see. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so Abdul Salam, Dr. Salam again came yes. up with another follow up. He was like, in case a foot limb presentation, in case of a foot limb presentation, how would you assess the station? How would the assessment of the, the foot? Station the presenting done? part is the foot. So you are using the foot. The foot is the first thing that is coming. And remember, fruit limb presentation okay. or fruit okay. limb, right. uh, uh, so, uh, uh, yeah. you would just deliver by abdominal abdominal delivery. So you are not going to monitor labor for a fruit limb breach. If the foot is the first thing that you are feeling and not the sacrum, it's the foot that you are going to use. But we don't even monitor labor for foot limb breach. So... If you make that diagnosis, you should be preparing your patient for abdominal delivery. Okay, all right. And so there was another question. Mm -hmm. so what's the role of frog maneuver in modern obstetrics for persistent sacral posterior? Is it still done or safer to opt for a CS when diagnosed early? And the second question is delivery after coming head. Only Mauritius, Mauritius, was mentioned. Is Ben's Marshall abandoned or less practice from recent studies or the former is preferred? Okay, so let me start from the back. So from the, the former, uh, which is the 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 the, the uh, Mauritius Melive is the one that is really easily applicable and people usually perform. And Ben's Marshall, yes, it is done. And for that one, you would sweep the baby across the mother's pelvis onto her abdomen, and that will help deliver the baby. But it is not commonly practiced as the, the uh, SMV because the SMV comes out uh, much easier for people to, to practice. Now, the um, other question about the Prague maneuver. Prag maneuver mm -hmm. is very relevant, especially if you have the baby delivering and then the sacrum is posterior and not anterior. And you, you should know how to perform all these. And that's why we said breach delivery comes with a lot of complications. And it is much better to have these deliveries done in practices where interventions can come very quickly. And you wouldn't want to wait. You, the baby that is going to turn sacral posterior will not tell you intra-abdominally that I'm going to be sacral posterior. So let's abandon prag maneuver. You need to know it as an obstetrician. You need to know it as a midwife. You need to know it as a doctor who operates within the labor ward premises and you are called upon. Because remember, you have barely five minutes to get this baby out. So you can't push the baby back in and expect to have a better outcome as a cesarean section. So these are maneuvers that are needed, but um, to make this presentation very concise, precise, and practical and relevant as possible, we tried as much as possible not to bring in all the uh, textbook stuff across because these ones don't occur very often. So 
um, forgive the omissions. It doesn't mean that they don't exist. If we want to do a thorough presentation on breach, this definitely wouldn't have been in enough. 40 minutes would not be enough. So thank you. I think that's all we have in the comment session. So all right. Okay. Any, any so, closing remarks? Yes. So thank you so much for staying on with us. We hit the 80 participants mark and beyond, and we are still uh, above 80. And I'm glad that people did not log out. It means that that's we were sharing something meaningful. So thank you for participating. And um, thank, I thank Dr. Velda for the time that you have put into this. It was a very short notice, but you came out and presented nicely. And uh, we are looking forward to next week's presentation. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. See you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.